Professor Sabrina Pauli of University Darmstadt. Uh, the workshop is on uh, ex motivic explorations in enumerative geometry. Okay, thank you very much. Is my mic on? Is that okay, awesome. So thank you very much for the introduction. I'm really happy to be here and give this lecture series. I'm really excited. So now I've I can really spend some time to explain everything in detail. Here's an outline for the four lectures. So today I'll start with um, reviewing enumerative geometry problems over different base fields. There will be a lot of overlap with uh, Mark's talk last week. So for you, those of you who were there, this is maybe a repetition, but that's also good. But I assume also some of you weren't there. So then maybe this is new. Then. In the second talk um, tomorrow, <coughs> I will talk about formulas for the local A1 um, degree because I will use these for computations. And also here, there will be a lot of overlap with uh, Stephen's talk yesterday. But um, from lecture three on, I don't think there will be any overlap anymore uh, because then I will introduce um, tropical curves for the following reason, one can take objects in algebraic uh, geometry and turn them into tropical objects, which are just um, combinatorial objects. So for curves, this is just graphs. And then um, uh, solve problems in the new wave geometry um, on the tropical side, where it's just uh, combinatorics problems. And that's what I'm going to talk about in the last lecture, how to relate all of this. But uh, yeah, let's start with the first lecture on the new wave geometry over with different um, fields. And I'll start with the complex numbers, and I'll do this today with two examples. Um, and the first example is also something that al already occurred in Mark's talk, uh, is Fizu's theorem. Let's recall what this says. So let's say, we have hypersurfaces, let's call them Hi, and these are defined by the vanishing of a polynomial where the degree of Fi is Di inside projective space. Then, uh, let's do this for i from 1 to n, and then I can sum up over all the intersections of the hypersurfaces. Um, and I sum up the multiplicities, the intersection multiplicities. And what I get is the product of the degrees. Of course, this only works if we actually only have finitely intersection points, so we assume that. Let me draw an example. So uh, let's do n is equal to 2, and let's draw a degree 3 curve. So this is an elliptic curve. So this is of degree 3. And let's intersect it with a conic. So this is of degree 2. And at least in this sketch, you see that there are six, six inter, uh, intersection points, but I'll come back to this later. So um, let's also recall how one, one way to prove this. That's also occurred in, in Mark's talk. So this for this, let's recall that if you have a vector bundle, of rank R, I guess maybe let's say rank n, and it agrees with this here. Um, then let's assume that here x is uh, smooth proper scheme over k, uh, or over c, we'll replace this later. Um, then uh, the top churn class, so the nth churn class here of this vector bundle, um, we've seen in Mark's talk where this basically was the definition and uh, repre uh, represents the class of the zero locus uh, 
of a generic section. So here we have sigma. So we want to use this fact um, to write down a proof of Bezu's theorem. So I have to find a vector bond. So what should B be? And we call this B Bezu because there will be another vector bundle in a second. Uh, this is just the uh, direct sum of O of D1, O of Dn, like this. And then uh, we also want uh, a section. Um, but we already have a section, basically. Um, Fi gives me a section of O of Di. So the Fi define me a section of this vector bundle. Um, and the zeros of um, this section um, are exactly the intersection points, basically, just by definition. You just write it down. So we're exactly in this uh, situation. We want to count intersection points, i.e. zeros of this section. So uh, we know that this is represented by the top churn class. So what we can do is we can take the degree of this top churn class, and this will compute the sum of intersection multiplicities. So Mark also said this in his talk. Um, this is a direct sum of line bundles, so we can use the uh, Whitney sum formula, uh, which just tells me that this is the product of the degrees of the first churn classes of the O of the i's, uh, C1, O of the n, this, and this is just the product. Let me give you another problem in enumerative geometry where we don't count uh, points but lines. Namely, we want to do lines uh, on a cubic surface. Let's make it a smooth one. So what do I mean by, by a cubic surface? I look at the vanishing of a degree three homogeneous polynomial in P3. Um, and now I want to figure out how many lines are there on there, so how many P1s are, are contained in it. And it's a classical result that the number of lines uh, in here is always always 27. So this doesn't depend on, on the f I choose. It doesn't depend on the cubic surface as long as it's smooth. So let's also try to uh, sketch a proof using this technique. So first of all, what should be our, our base? Earlier we were counting points, so the base was kind of parameterizing points. Now we're counting lines, so we need something that parameterizes lines, and that's uh, the Grossmannian. So you can either think about it as the Grossmannian of um, two-dimensional um, subspaces of C4, or the Grossmannian of lines in P3. 
Um, so this is the Grossmannian of lines in P3. Um, and now we need a vector bundle on it. So let me first start with the, let this be the tautological bundle. So what is this? Over a point in here, which represents a line, we just put the vector space, uh, the two, this two-dimensional vector space, which defines the line, or which corresponds to the two-dimensional vector space, if you prefer to think about it like this. And then let V, and now let me also decorate it, let's say maybe cubic for cubic surface, be the third symmetric power of the dual of the tautological bundle. Um, so, so what is this? <coughs> so um, now instead of the tautological bundle, so instead of having the vector space over e each point, we take the dual and then the third symmetric power. So what does this mean? This means that if I have a line in here, so I put the brackets around it to say that this is the point corresponding to the line, then the fiber here is the degree three homogeneous polynomials on this two-dimensional vector space L. And this turns out, uh, okay, what can I erase? Yeah, yeah, it's more about me planning what to keep <laughs> when I want to go back to visit. Uh, we know this now, so let's erase this. So now, uh, okay, erase it, but we wanted to um, uh, solve this problem by computing a, a top churn class, uh, the degree of a top churn class, which represents the zero locus of a general section. So we need a section here. And I claim um, that my uh, cubic surface actually defines a section. So let me write down what this section does. So we have a section. Um, defined by, if I evaluate it at a point corresponding to a line or a two-dimensional vector space, I just restrict f, uh, f to the line. And that will give me a three, uh, degree three polynomial on the line. And also, um, if f um, vanishes on the line, this just means exactly that the line is contained in the cubic surface, so we get again this correspondence that the lines on the cubic surface, which were defined by the vanishing of f, correspond exactly to the zeros of sigma f. And um, we can compute um, uh, the top churn class again. So turns out that um, this, this, this bundle has rank four, so we uh, compute the fourth turn class, which this is easy to see. We have uh, degree three homogeneous polynomials in two variables, so we have um, four different monomials, which are a basis for this. And also, actually, the Grossmannian has dimension four, so we actually get finitely many things. Um, so when we compute, the degree of the top churn class. I'm not telling you how to do this. You can do this with Schubert calculus. And then you get the 27 
as it's already written there. Okay, so that was the, the first field. So next I'll start with the, next, um, with the real numbers. So maybe it's a good uh, point to stop for questions. Okay, seems good. Um, okay, let's do this um, over the real numbers. So let me start with example two this time. Let's do this over the real numbers. So now what I want to do is just go to back to like classical topology. So let's look at cubic sur uh, surfaces in RP3 and ask how many real um, lines there are. And this is something that was um, computed by um, Schlieffi that the number of real lines on this real cubic surface, um, this could either be three or another three or seven or 15 or 27. It, and it depends on f. And why do I write the three two times? They're like, there are two components with, with three in the space of, of, the, of these cubic surfaces. But yeah, you could also just think about it. It could either be 3, 7, 15, or 27. So unlike in the situation for the complex numbers, this depends on your f. So uh, this is a bit unsatisfying, but uh, we could still get a, a count which is independent on, on f in the following way. And for this, uh, we use the following idea. So I erased this, so maybe this was not the, good, the best board to erase, but we, we computed um, these, the 27 and the, the Bizou theorem as the degree of the top churn class because this uh, represented the zero locus of a general section. So how do we do this in topology? Well, we replace the top churn class with the Euler class because you can also think of this as being um, representing the, the zero locus of a general section. So replace um, C, uh, let's just say top churn class of the vector bundle with the Euler class and compute the degree. So let's see what we get from this. I can already tell you what it is in this case. Maybe as a motivation. So in this case, one can compute that the degree of the vector bundle, which I called uh, V cubic, was actually, is actually three. And this is something that was computed basically by Segre, uh, even though he didn't write down the three, but it, he, um, divided the lines into two types and saw that the difference is always three. But I'll come back to this, maybe. <laughs> okay. So, where's the. Okay, so what does this uh, degree of the, the Euler class tell us? Well, it doesn't give us a, the count. <laughs> kind of seems like it gives us a lower bound, which is actually true, um, but it doesn't give us a count. Um, so let me explain to you what, what this actually means. And in order to do this, and also in order to generalize this later, let's recall what the Brow degree is. from algebraic topology. So we've already seen this in a couple of talks, I think. Um, so if you have a map from the n-sphere to the n-sphere, um, you can look at the 
induced map and n reduced homology with c coefficients. like this. And then um, this you identify with the integers. This you identify with the integers in the same way. And uh, so this map is just uh, given by multiplying by an integer. And this is the degree of f. Since uh, this is a homotopy invariant, if I have two homotopic maps, uh, they will have the same degree. So Actually, I can assign to a homotopy class of an endomorphism of the n-sphere. So this is homotopy classes. <coughs> Sorry, this is a bit slow, uh, small, an integer. You might also remember from your first course in algebraic topology that you can write the degree as a sum of local degrees. So now. Let's pick a point here in the target. Let's call it Y. And let's take all the pre-images of Y. And let's assume that there are finitely many. Then I can write the degree as a sum of local degrees. So I uh, can also explain what this is. Maybe this is good for tomorrow. Um, so what is the local degree? If you have a map of n spheres, then if you have a point y here, and you have a couple of pre-images, then what you can do is you take small neighborhood around here, small neighborhood around here, small neighborhood around here, small ball. Let's just take small balls around here. And let's call this u and this v. And then what you can, you can choose this such that the boundary of u is mapped to the boundary of v. And if you take small balls, this will be in Sn minus 1. This will be in Sn minus 1. Um, and the local degree at I guess this is x1, is the, is the degree of this map. And then you could use excision to show that this splits up as a sum of local degrees. But I'll come back to this tomorrow when we do this in the motivic setting. So what does this have to do um, uh, here with, with this problem? Um, I wanted to keep this, so I think I can erase this. So now that P be a, let's say, real rank n vector bundle. And let's say um, x now is a smooth closed n manifold. So compact without boundary. That's what I mean by, by, by smooth. Then I'll need a couple of definitions. First one is that this vector bundle is relatively orientable. If there's an isomorphism of line bundles from you take the hum bundle, you take the determinant bundle of the tangent bundle of x to the determinant of this vector bundle, and you have an isomorphism to the trivial rank one bundle. So why do we need this? 
you need this for the following. If I have um, now uh, if I'm in the situation that I have a point X, which is in, we have an open neighborhood around X, and I want to choose um, a trivialization of my vector bundle and coordinates around X, which are um, compatible. So if for every, every point, I want like some global compa compatibility. So we say that so this is an open neighborhood. We say that local coordinates around x and the trivialization um, of the vector bundle. So the restricted to u is u times rn are compatible with rho <coughs> this works uh, if uh, the following is satisfied. So my local coordinates give me a uh, locally section uh, of the determinant of the tangent bundle and the trivialization gives me a section um, uh, locally around u of the determinant of v. So I can apply a uh, row to uh, this, the distinguished um, section of this line bundle and I want this to be sent to, to one. And this makes it compatible, like this makes all the choices compatible globally. because we want to take local degrees after that. So we kind of need to make compatible choices. So, uh, so to finish it, the sentence, if the, uh, let's just call it distinguished section of home that V restricted to U is sent to to the section one by row. So by the distinguished section, I really mean the section determined by the local coordinates and the trivialization. And then uh, if I have this and I can locally write, if I have a section sigma, around the point x, I can write sigma, if I choose coordinates, this will go from Rn and I have a trivialization, so this will go to Rn. And the local index, the definition is by definition the index, is the, by definition the local degree at x of sigma, and now I really mean the sigma. So locally this is Sn, and this is Sn, so I can take the local degree just like there, and uh, the local index is just the local degree. And all this technical work was really just to, to make a compatible choice of coordinates and trivializations. So what is this good for? Now, the proncury hopf theorem tells me that the degree of the um, Euler class in the setup that we have the relative orientation is equal to the sum of local indices, where I sum up over all the zeros of um, a general section sigma. So this looks very 
similar to what we had in the in the complex case, we also just summed up all the, over all the zeros of uh, of a general section, but we just weighted them with one or with the multi with the with the multiplicity. But now we have this uh, local index. So what is this local index? Let's go back here to the cubic surface case. So one thing one can show for smooth cubic surfaces is that um, the zeros of the corresponding section are actually simple zeros. So the multiplicity of the zero is actually one. So locally, around the zero, we have a homeomorphism. And the degree of a homeomorphism is either, either one or minus one. So in the cubic surface case, this local index is um, either plus one or minus one. And uh, this here is really the sum over the lines on the cubic surface of these local indices. And these will either be plus or minus one. And I can even tell you a geometric description of this, um, which was already found uh, by, by Segre, I think in the 1950s. Uh, he classified all the lines on a cubic surface. Namely, if you look at a real, real line, which is just an RP1, so this is a circle, and you look at how it sits in the, in the cubic surface, what you can do is you can, at, either, either, uh, at any point of the, the circle, you could look at the normal vector pointing out of the cubic surface and follow it around. And then two things can happen. Either you do like a full turn or you do like a half turn and go back. And in case you do a full turn, this local index will be a minus one. And in case you, you do like a half turn and then you go back, uh, this uh, will be a plus one. Segre called the first, uh, the lines which do a full turn, he called them elliptic and the other one hyperbolic. So it turns out that the number of hyperbolic lines minus the number of elliptic lines is always three. So here we just have three hyperbolic lines where you do a half turn and a half turn back. Here you'd have, now I have to think, I guess five and, and two. So five hyperbolic and two, two elliptic and so on and so forth. I don't think you get the, the, you don't get the Mobius. I think you do like really, like a full turn. It's not like a, I think they all will be all oriented, all the normal, normal bundles. So the, the um, but. It's like, um, like the Gauss map is a degree two map. Um, Right. So, but the one where you go uh, do a half turn and then you go back, that's the, the hyperbolic oh, one. Yeah. Yes. Ah. Okay. So, so there's even like a nice geometric uh, description of this, uh, which you, I don't know if there's any good reason for this. Um, you can just write down equations and then this comes out of it. So I kept this Bizu example just to replace everything with real things here. So let's do that. Uh, if I find my eraser, here it is. So you can also do this in RPN. Um, and then also try to do the same thing. So let's first do this here. Uh, in the example. So you want to compute local degrees and we will see tom tomorrow um, this will, these local degrees will actually be given by, well we go to like just a, an affine chart and then we uh, compute the determinant of the Jacobian of the, uh, at the intersection points. So this Jacobian, this really records in which way the two curves intersect. So let's orient these curves like this and like this. Doesn't matter how you orient them, the total sum will be the same. And then if you start here 
uh, let's, let's walk around um, the conics or the orange curve. So here the, the, the white curve comes from the right. That's a sign here, a plus one. Um, here it comes from the left, so it should be the opposite. Here is a plus one again, here minus one, here plus one, here minus one. And you see that if you sum all of these up, you get zero. And this is really not surprising because what do we want to compute? We want to compute the degree of the Euler class of V, I think I called it V bizu, of this vector model, which was the sum of the O of the i's. And this is really not surprising because here we also have a Whitney sum formula. So this will be the degree of the Euler classes of the, the line bundles, but the degree of, um, or the Euler class of uh, an odd rank bundle is always zero. So this should be zero. And now these really, these two curves really intersect in, uh, in six real points. But if I, for example, move the orange curve to, to the right here, then we would lose these two intersection points. But this doesn't matter. It just loses the one, one plus minus one. We still get zero. So this looks like a good theorem, but it's, it doesn't always work. Um, maybe let's go to n is equal to 1, because there I can uh, draw better examples. And let's look at uh, degree 3 curve. No, no, I want to do n is equal to 1. I really want to do like, so this is n is equal to, to 2. Let's do n is equal to 1. And let's look at uh, the graph of a degree 3 curve then uh, the local indices are given by really just the sign of the derivative. So we're counting zero. So here we have three zeros. So we really can't get the, the, the zero here. So something has to go wrong. Um, but the local indices are really given by the sign of the derivative. And you see, if you add these up, you get plus one and not zero. So the question here is, why, why doesn't this theorem hold? So one of the things in the poincare hopf theorem is not satisfied. And I didn't give you any assumptions here, so I have to tell you. Uh, in this case, this is really not relatively orientable. Otherwise, you would get zero. So today in the exercises, you will see that um, uh, this is true, you show this is relatively orientable um, if and only if the sum of the di is congruent to n plus 1 mod 2. Like this. So this doesn't work for n is equal to 1. We need something even. And if we have something even, then I mean, you can imagine, well, all of this works. So this was the, the, the real numbers. So let me pause here again, because next I'll move on to arbitrary field. Are there any questions? OK. So now, um, the idea now is to, uh, we've already seen the A1 degree um, in many of the talks. And the idea now is to replace uh, the, the Brouwer degree by the A1 degree. So. Let me just erase this. So, uh, The idea 
And um, I think the first, uh, the, uh, this was Jesse Kass and Kirsten Wickelgren who used this idea of replacing in this poincare hopf theorem the, the, the local degree by the local A1 degree to compute the number uh, or, or count of uh, lines on a cubic surface. So the, the idea here was replace this guy I just erased by uh, the A1 degree. So now we have A1 homotopy classes of the motivic ends here. And now this is not valued in the integers, but the growth and the wittering um, of non-degenerate quadratic forms over k. So here there are classes of, uh, the elements here are classes of non-degenerate <coughs> quadratic forms over k. I'll introduce this tomorrow when we'll do a lot of computations in here, or especially in the exercises tomorrow, there will be a lot of computations in here. But for now, let's just take this as a black box. So the idea was to replace this. I have one thing. Um, also, um, Jesse and Kirsten showed that earlier we had seen that the uh, degree would um, split up as a sum of local degrees, and this also works if I just put an A1 everywhere. Just like before. So now, I kept all of this because now we want to just do this and this and replace everything with a A1 degree. So let's see. So now instead of a real rank n vector bundle, I just take an algebraic rank n vector bundle on how well, should I replace the closed n manifold? I replace it by a uh, smooth proper, let's also make it n-dimensional k scheme and I think k could just be an arbitrary field now. Then uh, we also need to replace this relative orientability condition which gave us a compatible choice of local coordinates and trivializations. And it turns out that the following suffices. So we say that this vector bundle is relatively orientable if um, there is a line bundle L such that there's an isomorphism to the square of the line bundle. So L over X um, is a line bundle. Then we also need to choose uh, coordinates. Uh, I think I don't have enough space here. So I'll just erase this. So first we need something like coordinates. And the correct notion here is um, Nisnevich coordinates. So what are they? This is an etal map from, so now we have x and u inside of x, where u is a Zariski neighborhood of x. And these neighborhood coordinates are an etal map like this, uh, plus one extra condition, um, which induces an ISO on the residue field of X. So say K of X, this is the residue field. So now we also need some compatibility uh, thing here. Well, 
What is that? Coordinates won't set x one to zero. Ah. Uh, like yeah, you can like this. You can arrange that it's and uh, ah no, it won't, it won't. Right, but this doesn't. This should be fine, right? Yeah. yeah that it does. No, no, it doesn't. I mean, it could be that k is not the residue field. Yeah. Yes. Thanks. So we say that this Navid coordinate and uh, and the trivialization. So we want to trivialize v are compatible. With the relative orientation row, if um, so, if we choose um, uh, Nisnevich uh, coordinates like this, it turns out that they actually give me also locally a section of the of the tangent bundle, just like before. Um, also, if the distinguished element, and also the trivialization gives me a section locally of the determinant of the vector bundle. So I get in a distinguished element again, a distinguished section again. Uh, of this thing here. Just like before, just copy pasting. Um, is sent to, now not the one, but this section is sent to actually a square of a section. So Little l here is uh, a section of l. And if I can write the image of, of my distinguished element as um, l tensor l, then this is compatible. And this actually makes sense. Um, we'll see tomorrow that uh, if I have something in, in Grof and Degrit, if I have two quadratic forms which differ by, by a square, um, then they represent the same thing in the Grof and Degrit ring. So if I choose uh, local uh, or Nisnevich coordinates, different Nisnevich coordinates and uh, different trivialization, and I compute this, what I get will differ by a square. So it won't differ in the Grof and Dick ring. So again, locally, Kassel and Rickerwin show that one can write down like um, sigma again, where sigma, yeah still a general section. You can, again, write locally equations. So you get locally, earlier we had a map from R n to R n. And now you have a map from A n to A n. And the local index now is just, just like before. But now the local A 1 degree. So tomorrow we learn a lot of formulas uh, about this. This might look a little scary, but in all the examples we've done, like um, Vizu's theorem and, uh, and lines on a cubic surface, we can actually pick these Nisnevich co coordinates just to be, like you just find u, which is just isomorphic to an, and then everything is not so hard. So in, actually, in all the examples, I know this is the case. Yes. Well, like no, that's like the the. This is just not the not the zero, I guess. That's isn't that what you just ask? Like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you base change to kx, you take the trace, and then this is exactly this. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yes. Tomorrow we'll also learn how to compute the trace. <laughs> um. And now, uh, here. We had the poincare hopp theorem, which said that the degree of the Euler class was the sum of local indices. And now we can also do this in the A1 setting. And this was shown by 
um, Tom Bachmann and Kirsten Wickelgren. Um, who say that called this Na1 B rho. I will always drop the rho, but let's write it now down. The rho is the relative orientation. So let this, let's, let's call this A1 Euler number and define this to be the sum of um, zeros of a general section and let's put the local indices here. And they show that this is well defined. So what does this mean? This is really independent of the choice of section here. Um, the way they do is that uh, this is by equating this uh, with, with other Euler numbers, or one can also show that this is really the degree, when, uh, let's say, some A1 Euler class. I think Mark also mentioned in his, his talk. But if you weren't at the talk, you could just take this as a theorem. Yes. And uh, as I said, Jesse Kuss and Kirsten Wickergram used this to, to uh, do a line compound of lines on cu uh, a smooth cubic surface. So they showed that this A1 Euler number of this SIM3 S dual here is 15 times the class 1 plus 12 times the class minus 1 in the growth and degree thing. Okay. So um, I'll define these two more, but maybe I'll just write it down. So bracket A, you will see this tomorrow, is the class of the quadratic form which sends uh, x to a x squared. And a is in. Okay. Let me finish, it's still there, with uh, Bezu's theorem in the setup. And this is a theorem by Stephen. Um, you will prove today in the exercise that you need the same assumption. So if, I guess, hi is the vanishing, fi now in p and k, and the degree of fi is di, for i is equal to one, one to n, then um, if you further assume that the sum of the di is congruent to n plus one mod two, then this a one Euler number of what I called v v zoo. Uh, is d1 times the n over 2 times 1 plus minus 1 in the growth and degree ring. Okay. So, yeah. So, if we go back here to the picture, we could just um, uh, do the same thing here. We'll see tomorrow that. Uh, the local degree here is just the determinant of the Jacobian of the two defining equations. Um, so I can write this down. So this is equal to the sum 
of x in the intersection hn. And what you want to do is you take the determinant of the Jacobian of the fi, evaluate it at x, and stick the bracket around it. But as, as Mark said, this might, x might have um, not be defined over k. You might have to go uh, to a field extension. So what you do is you have to trace down from the residue field uh, to k, but it'll define the trace um, tomorrow. And you'll see why this, this formula occurs tomorrow. So I'm actually a bit faster than I expected. This will probably won't be for the, the other lectures, but, but let me stop here. <laughs>